a little news and update for Sunday the 28th of February. Please continue to pray for the activities we're involved with that benefit others. So Crosslines is helping the vulnerably housed and homeless people with food. Roundabout, the uh, activity that Sue organises to help struggling families. And also the Refugee House, especially this uh, plan to set up a second house for a second refugee family that Andrew Staley talked about last week. If you want information about how to get involved with that, I just want to remind you, go to our website, go to the news section, and there's uh, stuff there about volunteers that are needed for this next stage. And a reminder that online Alpha starts on Tuesday the 9th of March, so there's still time to invite, so um, do get in touch and invite people, be brave. Yeah, just really want to encourage you. Uh, I was thinking, I've spent a long time thinking about how would I word an, an invitation to someone, and I just was struck by actually it's probably less important than me just going and doing it. So I really want to encourage you, there's plenty of time for the night to invite people to get involved uh, and come along to the Alpha. So please be, like Sarah says, brave and do that. We also need some team, uh, really simple roles just to help it run smoothly over the eight weeks. Um, so we want people from the church to do that. So if you're bringing someone, if you're accompanying someone, it's great to do it. But even if you're not, but you think I'd love this to work, you can do that. So you just follow the same link on our website to uh, register and say that you're up for helping. And we're gonna do training for that on Tuesday the 2nd. So um, it, probably you will see this before Tuesday the 2nd. I know some groups watch this afterwards, but Tuesday the 2nd, we're going to do training for how to help. It is really simple. Yeah. And we have a video now from Sunny, who leads a church in India who we've been connected with for a long time. So here's the video. Hello friends at Exeter Vineyard. I just want to bring my heart full of greetings to you from Dehradun Vineyard. And uh, what a journey it has been in our relationship for so many years now. And I just want to take this opportunity to just want to express, you know, a deep gratitude and thankfulness for your friendship and relationship with us over these years. You know, this last couple of years has been crazy for my life, as you know, or some of you may know. In 2019, I lost my dear wife, Vika, and, and then this pandemic this last year has been really hard for us as a family and even as a church. But in all of this, we have continued to sh see God's favor and his love expressed to us to friends like you. So the situation for Christians in India is actually quite complicated. It's quite a hostile environment at the moment. So we, we cut that video of Sunny a little bit short. If you would like to know more information and specifically ways that you can support them, please can you get in touch with me directly or look on our closed Facebook group and uh, we'll give you some more information about that there. Yeah, and the final bit of news is next Sunday or next weekend, our online service will be a joint one uh, uh, with ourselves and the other six uh, churches in the southwest region. Other vineyard churches, vineyard. yeah. So we did we did this again <laughs> in the summer. So it's going to look slightly different from what we normally do next week, our online service, but that's happening. So let's finish, as we always do, with a prayer to ground ourselves and remind ourselves that everything we do is because of God is resourced by God and is for his glory. So let's pray this together. Loving God, you are making us into your bride and your body. Help us live in your love and work for your glory. We pray all the things we do would bring fruit for your kingdom. Amen. To start today's talk with a bit of a warning i'm going to talk about some things that are traumatic some traumatic incidences that may have happened to you and i just want you to be prepared maybe you want to have a pillow you can cuddle today as we talk about that because today's topic is i am chosen and we're going to look at a bible verse from ephesians 1 4 which says this he that is god chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight and so as we think about this idea of being chosen, I've come to film it here 
on a school sports field. And I want us to think back to our childhood and those incidences that we would have experienced in our childhood when we were maybe on the playground, on the sports field, maybe even in a PE lesson, we were forced to line up like unwanted puppies while two kids, the ones that life had dealt a handful of picture cards, got out the front and they got to choose the teams. And then we would stand there waiting to be validated by being chosen. It basically was a performance assessment of being a kid. It was your, it was your kid appraisal when you got picked. And uh, I don't want to put my issues on you, but being picked last like, just really hurt, right? And, uh, and we needed to get over it. So the thing is though, it didn't stop just when we left school, when we stopped playing British Bulldog in the playground. It carries on through life, through finding, you know, someone fancying you or doing your exams or going to job interviews or performance targets, league tables, um, you know, headhunters, all of these things. We go through life wanting to be chosen and it's competitive and comparative. You are always being chosen above and against your peers. And it's how we win. We win by being chosen instead of those other suckers who didn't get chosen. Uh, and so we have this deep need to be desired, to be attractive, to be skilled, clever, strong, more than others, so that we get chosen and we get validated. We get a sense of value and worth and security through being chosen. And by the nature of it, we succeed by others losing. So there's always this uh, dark twin of being chosen, which is being rejected. And that's an absolute fear for us to be rejected. So, so much of our life is defined by this idea of whether we are chosen, whether, whether our value can be found by us being chosen. And it is the worldly security that we look for, which is intrinsically insecure because we are competing for finite resources. That's what we want to be chosen against others because there's a limited amount to go around. And just the way things happen, we are going to get older, uglier, slower, weaker, stupider. We are always going to end up losing. And even the values that we are competing to be chosen for are arbitrary anyway. The things that make us attractive now, 400 years ago, made us ugly. And, um, and these things change. Uh, 4,000 years ago, you were considered a winner if you could kill uh, animals with a stone tool. Uh, yet now it's like, what car do you drive? Things like that. It's just all so arbitrary and weird, yet we place so much stock in it and so much of our value comes on this. And so I'm talking about this before we look at the Bible verse, because we need to recognize this level of competition and comparison that just goes on in the world. And it is so deeply seated that I don't think we can even think about, think what it would be like without it. Just as a complete aside, our geography is shaped by competition. Where our towns are situated is so that they could control water access or they could defend against other people that might want to come and steal their resources. Our whole world is shaped by competition and it's crazy, it's unimaginable to think what the world's going to be like when God makes it fresh and we start to build the world anew and instead of competition we are working with cooperation. Can't imagine what that would be like but we just need to recognize that this sense of competition and comparison is so deeply ingrained in us that when we read this Bible verse, we cannot bring that understanding to the Bible verse. Otherwise we will miss or, or what more likely we do, we will devalue what it says. Because what we are saying today is I am chosen. God has chosen me. He has chosen you. And we want to devalue it because we say, yeah, 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 yeah. But that happens for everyone. You know, it's a bit meaningless. It's just so spread out because we think of, we are competing for a finite resource and we think, well, it has to be spread out among everybody like that. And, uh, and it doesn't feel, I don't feel special because of it, because how can it be special for me if God's chosen everyone else as well? Okay, but we need to understand this is not, he's, God is not choosing us by the world standards. God is limitless. There is no 
finite resource that we are competing for. And also he is not choosing us based on the way the world does its choices. So let's read the verse again, slightly different translation this time. It says this, even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. So I want you to just imagine, to picture what this verse is talking about. It's talking before creation, before time and space had been created, God is having a conversation. The three persons, God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, are having a conversation about you, about me. They're having a conversation about how much they love us, how wonderful they are, we are, and how much they want us, they want to choose us to be part of what they are doing, to be holy. Now, of course, we can't get our head around that because we can't imagine how God can have a conversation about seven plus billion different people, but that's just our limitations. Doesn't mean that God can't do it. So we have that first objection, but we devalue it because we bring this idea of competitive choice into this. So we think, well, God has chosen me, but, he's, but how does that make any difference? Because he's also chosen everyone else. But this nature of being chosen isn't based on our standard or our assessment or our appraisal compared to other people. It is based on who God is and what he is doing in us. We are chosen because of who God is and what he is doing in us. We are chosen because of who God has made us to be. You are God's work of art. You are his masterpiece. He is crafting you and he has chosen you because he wants to craft you. This concept blows our mind, but it is kind of something we're familiar with. At any time, about a third of the world is covered by snow. These tiny snowflakes that you need a microscope to see. Billions and billions of snowflakes. Not two are the same. You know, everyone is unique and individual. And of all the people in the world who have ever existed, everyone has different fingerprints, has different DNA. We understand uniqueness and individuality. And this is the nature that we understand our choosing because God wants to craft us individually and uniquely. And he chooses us because of that. When God made creation, when he created every single thing from the daisies and blades of grass we talked about last week to galaxies, to us, human beings were the only things that were made in the image of God. And this is why he is choosing us, because his image is in us. And our uniqueness and individuality express something of God's wonder, something of who God is, something of his image in a way that is unique to each of us. You see, God is so vast and amazing and awesome that there isn't, it isn't possible for any of us to purely reflect the wholeness of God. So what he has done is in each individual person, we get to reflect something of God's image that no one else can do in quite the same way. We are chosen because each of us reflects something of God into the creation around us, something that no one else could do or was made to do. And so God has chosen us to do that. Or well, it's like a resonance. You know, if you play, an, if you have tuning forks and you play a middle C on a piano and one of those forks is tuned to middle C, that tuning fork will start to vibrate, it will start to resonate with the note played on the piano. And in the same way, God is emitting, sustaining creation. And there is something in us, in each of us, that uniquely and individually resonates with that vastness of God's God's sustaining creation. And so we know from, the, from Jesus talking about us being lights, that there is something that we reflect of God that no one else can do. So God places us exactly where he wants that part of his image to shine to the people and situations around us. Or as we resonate, we, we bring a note to those people and situations around us that they need to hear. And even more wonderful, as we gather in church, what we do is our individual resonance works together to create an orchestral symphony that captures even more of who God is. So we are chosen because of this. You are not chosen because you are better than everybody else. 
and you are not rejected because you are not as good as anyone else. That is how the world does choosing. God is choosing you because he has done something amazing and unique that only you can do. And he has chosen you for that. He has designed you for that. And then he has chosen you for that. And this is the work he is doing. That conversation he had before creation was about how wonderful you are. And now you're here and he is going, his work in you is to make you become that version of yourself that he imagined before time space existed. You are chosen for that. And what he wants to do is develop that in you to make a difference to the world around you. And so I thought this is an interesting idea because if you, like me, have been trying meditating, just to spend even just five minutes having a bit of space and inviting God into that space, I'm sure, like me, what you find is you get distracted, you think about other things. And so I find myself continually having to choose not to think about that and instead choose to think about God. So I have to keep going back and choosing to, to centre myself on God, then I drift away and I choose again and I choose again. Every time I make that choice, something that should excite and uh, enthuse me, something that should breathe thankfulness in me, is to realise that while I'm choosing to be present to God, God has already chosen to be present to me. And that is the joy we were talking about last week, this joy that he has, this, this overwhelming, simple joy, is because he loves us so much and he chooses to be with us because it brings him joy. So God, we pray that we would become people that start to move out of the world's sense of competition, of valuing ourselves on how well we do against others and how well we perform on our workplaces or on social media or how well we are able to, um, to rise above the people around us. And that we would become people that understand that our security is in that you choose us and it is nothing to do with our abilities, but it's everything to do with what you have already put in us and what you're bringing out of us. And God, this week, as we try to spend time with you, as we try to meditate, as we continually choose to, to make space for you and to, and to be aware of you, that we would be energized and encouraged because you are choosing to be present with us. The creator of the galaxies and the molecules and the atoms chooses to be present with me with all of us in jesus name amen <laughs>